Well, thank you very much, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. Delighted to be here. So happy to, uh, to be a part of, uh, of this uh, speaker series opportunity. I want to begin by thanking Derek, um, who I spent some time reading about before I got here and uh, learned a lot of wonderful things about him and really what he uh, represents, uh, his commitment to public service, uh, his impressive record of accomplishment is really a role model for, for all of us. I think it's a, it's a remarkable gift to the community and of course everyone here knows that the Clinton School is in the business of developing remarkable public service so I suppose uh, we shouldn't be too surprised to find you here, Derek. So thank you so much for that very uh, warm introduction. In any case, I want to say how much uh, I'm pleased to be here myself today, and I want to thank the Dean for this opportunity to speak with you. It definitely feels like I'm among kindred spirits here at the Clinton School, because my remarks today will very much be centered on public service and community engagement. In my case, public service and engagement are directed specifically towards one topic, certainly one in which you all have a direct interest, and that is increasing college attainment. Now, as you may have gathered from Derek's introduction, it's been my life's work to advocate for the enormous benefits of post-secondary education, to make college accessible for all Americans, and to help ensure that many more students stay in school and earn their degrees. And I can say, after more than two decades of this work, I'm more convinced than ever in the power of higher education. In fact, college attainment has really never been more important. Indeed, it's vital to individual success and to the future of our nation as a whole. Over the last few weeks, we've seen unprecedented attention to the issues of college affordability and rising debt. As a result, we've also heard a lot about the value of a college education, especially in these economically turbulent times, as well as the quality of the credentials that we're awarding at our colleges and universities today. Well, in my brief remarks uh, with you here, I hope to underscore why a post-secondary degree or credential is really more important now than it's ever been, and how you can play a part in the critical national imperative of achieving much higher levels of high quality educational attainment for the vast majority of Americans. To give you some sense of where I'm coming from, I think it might be helpful to tell you just a little bit more about me and also about the foundation. First, the me part. I grew up in a family of limited uh, means and I'm proud to call myself a first generation college graduate. I was very fortunate. I had parents who pushed me and my siblings to achieve more educationally, even though they themselves never had those opportunities. I also benefited greatly from the support of the federal government, of the state that I grew up in, in Connecticut, of my church, of my alma mater, Bates College in Maine, of my community, and many others. In fact, uh, I mentioned earlier that I I call myself a walking advertisement for virtually every form of financial aid that was available when I attended college, uh, from Pell Grants to student loans to a whole lot of work. Now, my experience isn't unusual or atypical. There are many Americans just like me. But more importantly, there are millions more who need the opportunities that I was fortunate enough to have. And that's really where an organization like Lumina Foundation comes into play. Lumina, as Derek mentioned, is a national foundation that plays an, an unusual role as one of the nation's largest private foundations. We're committed to one single cause as a national foundation, enrolling and graduating more students from college, particularly low-income students, first-generation students, students of color, and adult learners. In fact, we're the largest private foundation in America that focuses solely on that mission. And we pursue that mission in a very targeted way. All of our energies, I mean all, and all of our resources are focused not on individual achievement through scholarships or other support, but on system level change that can lead to very large scale impact. Lumina's work is, in, is focused entirely on achieving that one ambitious 
but specific goal for college attainment, what we call goal 2025, or simply the big goal that you heard about, which is that we want 60% of Americans to hold high quality college degrees and credentials by the year 2025. Now, most of you here in this room today are aware that now, and really for much of the last four decades, the national de degree attainment rate has hovered at just below 40%. That level of college attainment, frankly, it hasn't really hampered us until recently. In fact, a decade or so ago, we led the world in this race. No longer. College attainment rates are soaring among young adults in many other nations around the world, while our rate remains essentially flat. Now, a year ago, we saw data from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development that showed that we were in eighth place in terms of the proportion of 25 to 34 year olds with post-secondary degrees and credentials. This year, we've already fallen to 15th in that proportion who've attained a two or four year degree. Clearly, in an age where economics and labor markets are increasingly global, this downward trend, or to put it a different way, the ascension of all of our competitors while we remain flat is very troubling. Today, and certainly in the years to come, Workers without college level learning simply won't have the knowledge and the skills that they need to succeed. In fact, the Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce has estimated that in the next decade, 63% of all of the nation's jobs will require some form of college education, post-secondary learning. It's a huge increase since just the mid-1970s when less than a third of all jobs required any education beyond high school. Well, let's, just, let's put this in the, uh, in the context of your, your home state here at the Clinton School. In Arkansas, 52% of jobs will require post-secondary education in the next decade. That means in that time period, Arkansas will need to fill more than 400,000 uh, vacancies resulting from job creation, from worker retirement, and from other factors. Of those expected vacancies then, more than half nearly 218,000 Arkansas jobs will require post-secondary credentials. <clears throat> now, at this point in my presentation, I know what some of you are probably thinking. You're thinking, what is this guy talking about? Hasn't he been reading the newspaper lately? Doesn't he know that jobs for recent graduates are in short supply and opportunities are more limited than they've been for many, many years? Well, let's talk about that. Here are some of the things that we know. First, the unemployment rates for those with college degrees are considerably lower than those who don't have a post-secondary credential. This is true even for recent college graduates. According to data from late 2011, national unemployment rates for 18 to 24 year olds not enrolled in school are about 8.9% for BA recipients. 11.9% for those with an associate degree, and a whopping 22.9% for those with only a high school credential. We also know that wage differentials for people with college degrees compared to those with high school credentials is wide. Now that's probably a fact that we've understood for many years. If you go to college, you generally make more money. What's less recognized is that that differential in wages is actually growing. And in fact, it's continued to grow through the economic crisis. Individuals with a bachelor's degree make on average 84% more over their lifetimes than those with just a high school diploma. This is an increase even since the late 1990s when the differential was about 75%. What that increasing wage premium I think shows is that the labor market is hungry for college graduates. Even in this job market, employers are willing to pay a premium for people with skills represented by those post-secondary degrees and credentials. So let's look at the picture a little different way. George, Georgetown Center uh, also shows just what, how important post-secondary education can be to job seekers. On average, in industries that are growing fastest, healthcare and various service industries, about seven in 10 workers have at least some college. On the other side of the ledger, the industries that are declining in terms of their relative share of jobs, 
only four in 10 workers have attended college. So the message is clear. In the coming years and decades, fewer and fewer jobs will be available to those who lack post-secondary education. So does this mean that everyone who graduates from college or university is gonna get a good job and lead a middle-class life? No. The point is, in this environment, a college degree is now a prerequisite. There's no guarantees in life, but in this case, for anyone who obtains a college degree, that they're going to get a good job and have a middle-class life. But the reality is, and I put this starkly, in the future, you almost certainly will be poor without some kind of post-secondary credential. Now, even that, I think, doesn't tell the whole story. The seismic shift that's now underway is a shift not from so-called low-skill occupations to high-skill occupations. It's that almost all jobs are becoming higher-skill jobs. Even in the so-called declining industries, the need for college-educated workers is becoming acute as the jobs become more complex. Jobs in manufacturing, in mining, really in nearly any practical field you can name, from auto repair to x-ray technology, now require some level of post-secondary education. What's more, all jobs are now demanding increasingly what are called, in my view, uh, incorrectly, the soft skills that higher learning provides. The critical thinking and the analytical skills, the problem solving, the communication capacities that are more important and more relevant in an ever-changing workplace. And here's an even, I think, more important and compelling truth about the benefits of boosting college attainment. It's not just a way to prevent job loss. It's actually a proven means to stimulate job creation. Economists tell us that much of the nation's economic growth over the last half century is largely attributable to two critical factors. The first is technology, not surprising, and the second is increased educational attainment. Now, why are these two so important? It's because in both cases, they increase productivity, and productivity growth is the engine that drives all advanced economies. When employers are given a more a highly educated workforce, they've actually been shown to organize the work in more efficient and more productive ways. They've learned through experience that hiring better educated workers actually increases productivity and, and enhances workplace cr creativity. This, in turn, helps fuel the innovation that leads to new products and services, new markets, and yes, new jobs to serve those markets. So the key to the nation's long-term economic success is a 21st century labor force, one with adaptable workers who possess high-level skills and relevant knowledge. And those skills, that type of knowledge, can only be offered in well-designed and rigorous post-secondary education programs. So that's why Goal 2025 is all about ensuring that many more students enroll in and actually complete those programs. It's all about the learning. <clears throat> of course, the benefits of higher education aren't limited to individuals, and they extend well beyond economics and labor markets. The broader societal benefits that we all know that Derek spoke about of a well-educated population are enormous, whether they are lower crime rates or less reliance on public assistance or better health or increased levels of civic involvement. And as Americans, I think we all recognize equity of educational opportunity as a shared value. Every person, regardless of their finances or their family circumstances, deserves the chance to succeed and contribute to our collective well-being. Like nothing else, higher education offers that opportunity. So for all of these reasons, Lumina Foundation is committed to that big goal of 60% attainment. As I said earlier, everything that we do as an organization is aimed at achieving goal 2025. The grants that we provide to support research and effective practice in higher education, our communications and convening efforts, and increasingly, our work in public policy, all of this has as a singular focus to boost the proportion of Americans who hold high quality degrees and credentials to 60% by 2025. Now, we recognize it's a very ambitious goal. 
In fact, we know that it can't be reached without the concerted and cooperative effort of stakeholders from every arena, including K-12 and higher education, the federal and state governments, business and labor leaders. My own visit here to Arkansas provides an instructive example of how we approach this work from many different uh, fronts. In addition to this visit here at the Clinton School, my agenda today includes meetings with public uh, officials, uh, the Little Rock uh, Regional Chamber of Commerce, meetings with educational leaders, etc. I'm also spending some time with the media to ensure that they get, hopefully, the right message as well. So it's a full day to be sure, but it offers a great opportunity, in my small case, to reach out to potential partners among a wide range of local institutions and organizations. Again, that sort of broad-based approach among all stakeholders is critical for this type of work, a lesson that I'm sure many of you have learned as students of public policy and social change here at the Clinton School. Now, one of the specific lessons that we've learned at Lumina is that we must strive to help make the employer community an increasingly important partner in the efforts to improve college attainment. Now, over the years, Lumina has enjoyed a good relationship with the, I guess you'd call it the supply side of the higher education enterprise. That is, with institutions and systems, and with the policymakers who help to create the environment in which these schools and systems operate. Clearly, we value these relationships, and we work hard to maintain and strengthen them because we seek changes uh, that simply can't occur without that help from the supply side. And I think for the purposes of this talk today, we can certainly talk more about those efforts as part of the Q&A. I thought I'd take a few minutes today, though, to talk about something that I haven't talked a lot about before, and that is greater involvement from the demand side. This includes students, to be sure, but it also includes employers and workforce development officials and other members of the business community because it's clear that as a nation, we need to tighten the connection between college success and economic success. And that connection needs to be tightened from both sides. In short, what we need to see is change from both of those sides. Now on the one side, higher education institutions and government officials need to do a better job of listening and responding to the needs of employers. They have to show a greater willingness to work in true partnership with the business and workforce development community to give students what they truly need to succeed in the job and in life. And they must eradicate the false distinction between what many tend to revere as education and what they often deride as mere training. It's well past time for a full realization that virtually all skills are workforce relevant and that all of them are constantly evolving. The work that we're doing at Lumina and really I think all that I've learned in more than my two decades of work in the higher education arena convinces me that fundamental change is needed on the supply side. Despite its many strengths, strengths that admittedly have served us so well as a country for many decades, the current post-secondary system is no longer able to meet the needs that we have for the 21st century. Now, perhaps the best indicator of the limited of the limits of the current system is a very real problem we've been talking about at a national level just in the last couple of weeks about college affordability. We all know that the increase in cost of higher education has been placing a burden on families and individual students for many years. But now, I think the challenge is even greater than that. In fact, I think it's clear that we've reached a critical crossroads when it comes to funding higher education in this country. To put it simply, what we've done just isn't working anymore. For decades, American higher education, the American higher education system, has essentially relied on two major sources of funding, government appropriations and tuition and fees paid by students and families. When one, when one was in short supply, institutions usually looked to the other. Both of those sources have increased over the last two decades to meet rising college costs though clearly at different rates. This is what I've called the, uh, I've called the mood music of the national conversations about uh, higher education that I've had the privilege of being a part of for more than two decades. But now, 
after years of those costs rising faster than the rate of inflation, rising faster than family incomes, rising faster even than the costs of health care, now the music has stopped. Both government and students are severely constrained in their ability to pay for these continuing cost increases. Yet the, the demand and really the societal need for increased college attainment is greater than ever before in our nation's history. That's what goal 2025 is really all about. It's about meeting that rising need. Now we recognize that this challenge is huge. We need to scale up the system so that it can produce the numbers of graduates that our economy needs while, in, while maintaining or improving the quality of life of its graduates. And unfortunately, without the likelihood of major new investments made by the federal government, states, parents, and students. In short, what we really need is a more productive system of higher education, one that enables institutions to meet each student where he or she is and provide the support that each student needs to succeed. We need a system that ensures quality by fostering genuine learning, not mere program completion. A system that truly prepares students for work and for life in an increasingly complex global society. Such a system, we think, should allow students to accumulate credits or learning units from a variety of different uh, perspectives and institutions over the course of several years to earn their credential, minimizing waste and duplicative effort. That system should also acknowledge and credit prior learning, skills developed through work or through military service, and which often reflects a student's abilities sometimes better than what you see through traditional classroom credit. Now at Lumina, we believe strongly that higher education needs to be far more focused on the needs of students than it has been in the past. And it's critically important that we focus on today's students, the ever-growing number of low-income, first-generation, minority, and adult students who we at Lumina like to call 21st century students, the students who constitute the real world on our college campuses today. Ultimately, this means that the higher education system has to become more student-centered, or to put it in terms that might better resonate if this was an audience of employers and business leaders, it has to be more customer-focused. By better serving its main customers, students, the post-secondary system is also going to meet the needs of employers, not to mention the ultimate customer base, which is American society itself. Of course, and as I said, the business community, that demand side, also has a major role to play in making the big goal a reality. And my Lumina colleagues and I are trying to do more and more each day to encourage employers to seize that role. Put most simply and directly, we're, in, we're encouraging employers to get in the game. Too often in the past, <clears throat> and my view is indeed even uh, today, despite the urgent need for a new approach, employers, local chambers of commerce, and workforce development groups have largely stayed on the sidelines when it comes to higher education reform. In far too many cases, we know what's happened. The business community has assumed one of two chief roles. The first is that it acts as a detached critic of the higher education system, and at other times, it serves as an unabashed supporter of a particular institution or two, often institutions that may actually have personal meaning to the person who happens to be leading that business or organization. What's needed now is for employers and business advocates to get off the sidelines, to actively and eagerly participate in a broad-based effort to increase college attainment. The numbers don't lie. Achievement of goal 2025 will demand steady increases in the number of Americans earning college degrees and certificates each year for more than a dozen years to get to 2025. Clearly, for that to happen, the higher education system will have to operate with much greater efficiency than it ever has before. New processes and procedures will be required. Innovative approaches will have to be taken, all in an effort to boost productivity and to maximize higher education's return on the investment. Now, obviously, these are lessons that any successful business person would say that he or she has learned and applied many times over, and they're lessons that certainly 
uh, need to be taught in the post-secondary uh, arena. Now I want to make a, offer a caution here about my own advice, which is colleges and universities aren't the same as businesses. We recognize that because what we produce is people, people with skills and knowledge and capacities, not products. So the lessons aren't exactly translatable and, and precise uh, definitions might, might vary. Still, I think if this approach to getting, gaining more productivity is mutually respectful and truly collaborative, there's no doubt that a great deal of progress can be made if business takes a more active role on this uh, productivity effort. I think it's also important that higher education focus much more of its efforts on increasing uh, uh, post-secondary attainment among adult students. The idea in targeting adults for post-secondary success is not simply to ensure that employers have a ready supply of trained workers for their own businesses. The view that's required is really much broader than that. Really, it's about empowering the individual because that's the power that ultimately drives every business. Finally, employers can't limit their working partnerships to those that include members of the higher education community. They also have to reach out to a third vital partner, and that's the policy community. In short, we think that employers need to become active and committed advocates for policy change, the kind of systemic, civically-minded policy changes whose aims are to improve the overall economy and to improve our society as a whole. In other words, we think it's vital that business leaders think and work expansively as they join this reform effort. Public-private partnerships are critical to our success as we work to achieve the big goal, but they must be inclusive partnerships, cooperative, mutually beneficial ones that involve business, higher education, and the policy community. Now, in practical terms, let me mention what we're talking about in terms of the the ask that we're offering to the, to the business community in getting to goal 2025. We've articulated this with three simple terms, company, community, and country. From the company perspective, each employer needs to take a direct and meaningful uh, role in aiding college attainment among its own workers. Some examples, more and better programs that provide tuition reimbursement, flexible working schedules to allow workers to attend college classes, assistance and counseling to help create individualized learning plans for their workers, use of company communications to promote employers' educational efforts, programs that offer tangible rewards to employees who earn degrees and credentials, and partnerships with higher education institutions to offer classes that are convenient, often at the work sites. Now next, from the community perspective, employers should make education a central plank in their platform of community engagement and community service. In fact, we think that boosting higher education attainment should be at the top of the list when it comes to corporate responsibility efforts. What better way to demonstrate good corporate citizenship than fostering an education-friendly uh, workplace? Such a move would not only open a wealth of partnership opportunities with other local organizations, it would also provide huge long-term benefits to that community. After all, a well-educated populace doesn't merely improve and deepen the local labor pool, it improves the quality of life really in any community. Finally, and most broadly, employers need to view this effort through the larger lens of country. In other words, Business leaders, and really all of us as Americans, need, be, need to be advocates for increasing college attainment because that's what the country really needs. Reaching that big goal, that 60% high quality attainment, will benefit all of us. A better workforce leads to more robust job creation, to sustained growth, and to greater economic security in this global age. A better educated citizenry also means increased civic involvement and greater social stability. So in other words, and in closing before I take your comments, goal 2025 isn't something for Lumina Foundation to achieve. It's not an initiative owned by the field of philanthropy or employers or the state and federal government or the higher education community. It is and it must be a broad-based, all-inclusive, national effort. Increasing post-secondary education is in everyone's in interest, 
and that makes it everyone's business. Thank you all very much for coming today. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thanks so much. We do have time for some questions. If you raise a hand, we'll get a microphone to you. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm just wondering what, uh, what the Lumina Foundation's stance is on for-profit universities. So the, uh, let me tell you a little bit about my, my background. This is the sort of truth in advertising portion of the program. So in the 1980s, um, I was writing about the uh, fraud of the for-profit sector in higher education. So um, I like to pat myself on the back that I was ahead of my time. Um, I shouldn't uh, pat too hard, though, because obviously in, um, in some ways a lot hasn't changed since then. But in some ways it has. One of the things that's interesting about the current environment is that there is high quality learning happening in some for-profits and there are big problems in the for-profit sector. And so it is a more muddled message than it was historically. In our view, where you get your education is going to gradually decline in importance over time and what you learn is going to grow over time. That's what a student-centered, learner-centered system of higher education is all about. And in that sense, what we should be figuring out is how we raise the bar for high quality learning at all institutions. Fraud, abuse, dependence on federal resources, these are all unacceptable things. But I think we've got to be careful, as Secretary uh, Arnie Duncan has said, to not throw the baby out with the bathwater here when it comes to the for-profits. We have to be careful that we make sure that we allow the opportunities for entrepreneurship, for growth, that we've seen are, that are possible in the for-profit sector and the not-profit sector and encouraging greater opportunities for student learning outcomes that lead to high quality job opportunities. So from a policy perspective, the issue is how do we get those policy uh, levers in place? How do we move those policy levers and actually create those opportunities? Right now we have a very cumbersome policy process in terms of how we accumulate and measure uh, credits, for example, that lead to learning. That system is clearly going to change over the course of the next few years. Anyone who picks up a newspaper and reads about MITx or who understands what's happening with organizations like Coursera or any of these others recognizes that both in the not-for-profit sector and in the case of MIT and Stanford and Carnegie Mellon, elite higher education, and the for-profit sector, there's a lot going on there, and some of that is quickly getting to scale. You probably know about the example of the the Stanford course that enrolled 160,000 people in the single course by offering it online. This demand, this hunger is huge, and we've got to find a way to tap it, whether it's in the for-profit or the not-for-profit sector, and make sure that we use the capacity of the system to serve a lot more people in a high-quality way. It's a big challenge at a policy level. Uh, I spent my career uh, before I, I entered philanthropy five years ago working on policy development at the state level at the federal level. I worked on public policy in, in um, eight other countries advising national governments from Southern Africa to the former Soviet Union to, to Asia. And I can tell you that uh, these uh, policy um, levers are very difficult to pull to just the right amount without there being unintended effects. But we've got to make sure that we create a lot more opportunities uh, for people. Yes, sir. Dr. Mary Sotis, can you tell us uh, specifically how the kind of creative grants you're making to bring about this uh, change that you're looking for? Yeah, let, let me mention a, a couple of things in terms of uh, some illustrations in terms of some of the work. One of the most important is that um, we consider uh, our grants and particularly how much we award in grants. We, we are the largest private foundation in the country that focuses on higher education at the fact. We consider it our least important metric in terms of our work. It's easy to contribute money. It's hard to get results. So uh, what we're focused on is making investments through a variety of means, whether it's through grants or through our public policy work or through our communication and convening efforts to get there. Some examples. We're now working intently in seven states on improving productivity in higher education. Actually, we're working in a total of 18 states, but seven very intently by trying to encourage productivity in higher education. The kinds of productivity that I talked about, not the kind of productivity that we all witnessed in the past, which was 
the problem's the faculty, let's just get them to teach more, everything will be fine. Wrong. That was a big mistake. The problem with our, our system of higher education is that definition that I talked about. We haven't gotten it to the point where we can increase the capacity to serve a lot more people with high quality degrees at the lowest possible uh, cost while protecting access and equity. So we've invested in these seven states to do things like create incentives for performance-based funding so that you reward program completion, particularly program completion that's highly mission relevant to the institution as opposed to merely enrollment. Many of the higher education funding formulas in this country for public institutions rely uh, intently on uh, uh, simply enrollment-based uh, funding formulas. I've written some of these funding formulas. I can tell you where all the bodies are buried. Uh, and uh, uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, more, creating more incentives for performance is very important. Now, does performance mean just graduation rates? No. So not all performance is the same. You've got to create mission uh, uh, differentiation. You've got to make sure that you put your thumb on the scale of low income, of minority populations, of, of, of workforce needs, et cetera. Got to do the same sort of thing with student support, by the way, uh, which is that we've got to make sure that our financial aid system helps students get into college and helps them succeed when they get there. Uh, I'm sorry to say that um, if, uh, even going back to my time, you're sort of an afterthought once you've gotten into college when it comes to the financial aid system. You're counted as a, as a, as a, as a success, a check mark, uh, once, you've, once you've gotten in the door. So the success ha metrics have to be more focused for students on encouraging progress and, and attainment while they're in school. Here's just one example of that, something that we've invested in, which is something called performance-based scholarships. So these are scholarships where what we know about very low-income students is that very low-income students face a single life event, often a very minor life event, that triggers a chain of things that leads to them dropping out and getting off, off the track. Their car broke down their child care costs went up, et cetera. So part of the problem with the financial aid system is that we give them uh, money in the first, beginning of the first semester, and we give them money at the beginning of the second semester. With performance-based scholarships, what you do is you allocate the money within a semester in bi-weekly increments, for example, based on some basic metrics of satisfactory academic progress. So rather than getting whatever, you know, make up the number $5,000 at the beginning of each semester, um, you get $500 in increments over the course of the every other week in, 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 in the term. That makes a huge difference in terms of the ability of those individuals um, to, to uh, stay in school and actually complete. And there is some evidence now that we've done with some experiments that, that actually works. Um, there's things to do uh, related to um, getting more business efficiency, administrative efficiency out of college and universities, um, uh, outsourcing certain kinds of functions, et cetera. That's the one that everyone thinks about when you use the word productivity. It's probably the, um, what my, one of my colleagues calls the lowest squeeze to juice ratio of any of the things we can try. Uh, but it's, it's important to, to, to not lose sight of those things. And finally, we've invested in, in those uh, efforts around increasing um, investment in new academic delivery models. The Carnegie Mellon Open Learning Initiative is something that we've supported, um, helping to develop accelerated learning programs. So we've now invested in accelerated associate degree programs. I'll tell you a quick, this is my last example. Um, in, um, we started in Indiana, and now we're doing it in other places, where um, we are actually, uh, we have students that are um, identified as uh, high-risk students. There are a variety of factors in high school you do the same thing for adults, but the, in this case, it's in high school. And we offer them a value proposition. If you go to college next year to the community college, we'll give you an associate degree in 11 months. And the associate degree is in targeted areas for which there's high labor market value immediately for them in, in the community. The trick is we treat their education as a job. They've got to go to school from 9 to 4 every day. They've got to participate in a prescribed curriculum. They've got to show up for work dressed appropriately. They've got to you know, do all those things that, that are expected in terms of a job. We also, in this program, pay them a stipend in addition to their financial aid as a way of offsetting their need to work, which is one of the challenges for very low-income students, is that this trade-off between 
basic needs in education really comes, uh, comes into being. And finding opportunities to get them the accelerated credentials and hopefully w continue working their way uh, up, the, up the educational ladder is important. So those are probably more examples than you wanted, but some, some examples of some of the things we're doing. Professor Ernst. Jamie, welcome to the Clinton School. Glad you're here. Just a couple of things I want to point out. First of all, if I'm not mistaken, you all have supported what I think is one of the more creative educational spaces in this country, and that's College Unbound. Uh, Dennis Lit Litke's work, yep. it's an extension really of Big Picture Inc. and the med schools yep. in Rhode Island. Yep. Which, but it's very different in a lot of ways what you just described. That is to say, that it's really focused on, on it isn't profoundly student-centered, but it's fo focused on students' interests and passions, right. which I think is a way, frankly, to honestly and morally enrich this, this often empty rhetoric of rigor. Uh, if you don't touch a kid's heart, if you don't inspire them, yeah. you can have all the rigor in the world, they're not going to do it. So my congrats for you all supporting what I think is, again, one of the most creative educational spaces in this country. The, the other thing I want to say, though, is that uh, uh, just to ask you to riff a little bit on this divide between academic and vocational. Uh, what we know, Mike Rose has a new book coming out in the fall called Second Chances, where he's going to talk about, and I think new powerful ways, about really honoring the intelligence of the American worker, of skilled labor. Yeah. Uh, and when you unpack that, the truth is, is that there may be more intelligence in an able carpenter than, I don't know, name the other academic. So I wonder if you talk a little bit about that. And then, of course, the backdrop of this is that a lot of academic institutions could care less about that kind of understanding, that, that knowing, if you will, about cognition and brain science, which is telling us a lot of different things about how people learn. Could you just expand that a little bit? Yeah, first on College uh, Unbound and, and examples like that, which are really sort of cutting edge, um, I describe these as efforts to gain a better handle on the motivational side of the equation. Um, uh, your point, I think, is the right one, which is that um, you've got to find ways to align what the interests are of that individual and shape them in a way that helps to contribute to what they see as their own success. And um, I think that um, uh, people who are motivated are gonna do very, very well. And so finding ways to foster that motivation through things like College Unbound are, are, are really important. You know, doing public service and, and doing the kinds of things that we've known for many years, Tinto's theory, of integration on campus that leads to, to greater retention of students, for example, is another example of that sort of getting at some of those motivational factors that are critical. College Unbound sort of takes it outside of that context into a whole, whole new level. I think, uh, well, you heard in my remarks, you know what my bias is, which is, which is that this idea that, on your second question, this distinction between academic and vocational is a, a false dichotomy. I get that some education focuses more specifically on job skills that are practical, that are, that are uh, technical in nature, et cetera, than others. But all jobs require two things, content knowledge and generalizable skills. It's difficult to find a job out there for which all you get is one, all you need is one or the other. So why would we, from an educational perspective, sell ourselves short? and say, no, we only do one of those things. It's somebody else's job to do the other one. That doesn't make any sense because, in fact, in, in many cases, what we do or what we say we do is actually what employers say they need in terms of those so-called um, um, job-specific skills. So the critical thinking and the problem solving and the analytic capacity, look at all the surveys of employers who say, that's not what we're getting, not just in you know, the people who are graduating from, from uh, uh, humanities or sciences programs, but people who are graduating from technical programs, from more specific or professional programs, et cetera. The point is, the colleges and universities and the, the other ways in which people learn should try to come together and learn from each other. I mean, I think one of the things you're gonna see in the next few years, because of labor market demand, is a huge focus on sub-baccalaureate certificates um, and um, uh, credentials below the sub-baccalaureate level. Um, Industry-based credentials are now really taking hold in certain sectors. Manufacturing being a good example, uh, please don't um, um, think of manufacturing as dead in the United States. It's alive and well, 
and there's a lot of good stuff going on in manufacturing. But it's more advanced, it's more precise, it's different than it was historically. And so the person on the dirty shop floor should not be the image of manufacturing today. It should be a person in a white coat uh, who's doing uh, some things that involve the use of computers, et cetera. Those kinds of, of, of manufacturing jobs, um, um, the credentialing that's being done within industries is related to what we do in higher education. So figuring out uh, how to break down those walls so that in higher education we can assess their prior learning, as I said, in the workplace or in the military or, or what have you, and then give them the added value that we can provide in higher education. Don't get me wrong, I believe that higher education has a lot to add here in terms of value. I wouldn't be doing this if I thought, thought otherwise. But I think that we've got to find a way to better recognize that and then apply the added value that I know we, we can apply. We have time for one more. Nikki. Hi, I'm Nikki Hamilton, I'm soon to be graduate of the Clinton School. Um, you mentioned that you meet with K through 12 and um, employees, but I'm wondering about what about bringing early childhood to the, to the table because that's where the foundation is laid and often determines the trajectory for, for kids for K through 12 and then for college. Yeah. If you can speak to that, please. So a, a, a huge issue. First, let me tell you, um, Lumina Foundation doesn't do a lot in that area. And, and the reason simply has to do with capacity. Um, my staff hates to hear me say this, but I say it almost every day, which is the question, where are we going to add value? We've never figured out where we can add value yet in early childhood education. We think we might over time. We know where we can add value on aligning the common core with what higher education is doing, for example. That's an area that cuts across the two, et cetera. We haven't figured out yet where we can add value in early childhood education. But your point is so critically important. We know what happens if young people can't read by, by the, you know, at grade level by third grade. We know what happens from zero to five in terms of cognitive capacity and learning uh, ability, et cetera. In fact, a quick, a quick personal story. When we moved to Indiana five years ago, uh, my wife and I and our children my wife was a college access professional. That's what she spent her life doing. She decided uh, for a variety of reasons to, uh, to step off the work track for a while and focus on family when we got to Indiana. And she said, well, I'm gonna try to stay under the radar and just you know concentrate on that. Well, we were there about three months and she figured out she was really mad about early childhood education in Indiana. And so she decided to do something about it. So she wrote a report for the governor uh, uh, that's staying under the radar in my wife's worldview, I guess. But um, to, to try to get at this by actually going around the state and visiting programs where real innovation is taking place in the early, early learning and try to figure out how to scale that. I think that there are eff there, there is a lot more effort that needs to be a, a made there. Our colleagues at the Kellogg Foundation have made this a big priority, and we are very grateful for that. Um, a, um, uh, something that many people don't know is that this is something that W.K. Kellogg, the founder of the Kellogg Foundation, actually wanted the Kellogg Foundation to do. And uh, so the, the need that Kellogg is trying to fit there as one, uh, one philanthropic organization we think is, is really important. But I can't um, overstate the importance of what, what you're saying, which is that it's critically important be, uh, because we lose so many people by the time they get to middle school and they've got those, uh, they've been behind on the cognitive challenges and it leads to all these other, other issues. And by the way, they're not socially or financially prepared as well. And the wheels come off and it leads to, uh, to, to those lower college attainment rates. So it's a, it's a very critical issue. Thank you all very much for this opportunity to be here. I'm very grateful.